Amen. Thank you, Tim. Church family, take a copy of God's Word, whether it's in paper form or electronic form, and turn with me to the book of John, chapter 17. John 17, as we come to the conclusion of our month of Prayer in the Word series, uh, we've been in this now for five weeks. It is our plan as a church to begin our year every year focusing on these two very important spiritual disciplines of God's Word and prayer. And today we're going to wrap this up by looking at the importance in regards to the sanctifying power of God's Word in our life in John 17. Before we jump into the text, let me just give you two other passages of Scripture that I'd like you to be prepared for as well that we will be looking at, Exodus chapter 19 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Our primary text is going to be John 17, 14 through 19. We'll, we'll, we will read through 21 But let me encourage you to have those two texts ready. Exodus chapter 19 and 1 Corinthians 6, as we will look into those as well. Tim mentioned to you that in regards to us as a church, you know, we do pray together. We've been having different moments that we've prayed together here on Sunday mornings. We're going to have a prayer time today at the end of our service, uh, so we will still be praying together. Uh, Let me also just update you, just uh, the power of prayer as well. Some of you knew as I gave you... Uh, an update regarding my mentor who was here back in August, he, Dr. Jim Shaddix, he was diagnosed with stage 4 brain cancer, a very aggressive form of cancer, and he underwent a uh, pretty major surgery last week, and they uh, were able to remove two tumors off of his brain. They discovered that he had a third, that they could not do surgery at that time due to the complexity of where the tumor was and the nerves and the way it was wrapped around that tumor. So they did not do it that time. Uh, By God's grace, many of people, not just in this church, but literally around the world have been praying for him. And so he's recovered very quickly within a week's time from his first surgery. So they chose to do the other surgery this week. And the doctor's report was he, he's done well, and they were able to get all of the tumor removed from his brain. And so he's able to have his mobility. Uh, his, his humor is back, so uh, someone brought him barbecue yesterday, and he said, nobody in this hospital is eating as good as I am right now. Uh, so thank you for praying for him, just, and continue to pray that God would just continue to uh, reco- help him to recover and to heal. Also, uh, in our church family, uh, last week on Sunday morning, Gina, where is Gina at? Where is Gina? There is Gina, right there. Uh, Her husband, Ron, uh, woke up, and these are her words, not my words, looking like a minion. He was looking uh, yellow. He had not been feeling good, and so they took him to the ER, and they told him two things. Either it was cancer or it was an infection of the liver. And so we gathered in five different homes already planned last Sunday night as a part of our prayer gatherings, and so I messaged all the leaders to let the groups know and to pray for him. At the end of our prayer times, we were informed that it was not cancer, and they were trying to determine what it was. Well, he was released from the hospital this week. He's simply waiting for his physical to be able to go back to work, so he went from a minion to normal this week. And so we just thank God for uh, God's answer to prayers for him. They're still trying to find out what happened, uh, but we believe we know what happens, right? We believe that God's power and his prayers touched his body, and so thank you for praying. Uh, so that God would just continue to help him to heal. So you see on this stage our prayer cards, and, and you came in today, and last week we've been putting prayer cards on your seat every week. And so some of you have prayer needs, and we're wanting to pray for those needs as a church. And there's two ways that you can give us those needs. There's two options on those prayer cards. Either if you want your church family to pray for those needs, you just simply mark it church family. And then during our response time, if you feel comfortable, you can come forward And you can take some time to pray over that need and lay it here on the stage. And what that means, if it says church family, then that means during response time, some of our church family is going to come and they're going to pray over those needs that are here. So if you feel led and you want to come pray for those things, you can do so. We've done that the past couple Wednesday nights. We're going to do that again this coming Wednesday night. But if if it's something private, you only want the staff to know and to pray over, you can put that in one of the baskets to my left and to my right. And then we as a staff, we take those, we pray over those. Because we believe, as we learned last week, that all things are possible with the Lord. And so just know that is what we're doing as a church. We don't want to just talk about prayer. We want to do it. We want to pray and believe. 
Well, this week, a couple of the opportunities as we wrap up our month of prayer in the Word. This coming Wednesday night, we're going to have another night of prayer and fellowship and the Lord's Supper. We'll have a meal at 5 o'clock. You can sign up for that on our app or the website. If you don't have any of those, just see someone at the welcome desk today. 5 o'clock, we'll, worship, we'll fellowship together. And then our service starts at 6.30 on those nights. We'll do fellowship. We'll worship together. We'll pray together. We share the Lord's Supper together. And we're going to just keep praying for these things. We gave out prayer guides throughout this month. If you didn't get one of those, they have some of those on the welcome desk. If we run out, we'll make a copy for you so you can be able to have those particular needs. But let me tell you where we're going after this series. After today, beginning next week, we're going to begin the Holy Spirit series that I've told you about that we were going to be doing back in the fall, but the Lord directed us to focus on end times and the return of Jesus. And we talked about that. We went into Christmas and then we did this. And it's time to begin the Holy Spirit series. The title of the series is going to be Holy Spirit, the power at work within us. And so I want to encourage you to be here. We're going to unpack what the Word says, both Old Testament and New Testament, of who He is, what He does, how He uses us, how He works in us. And so today you're actually going to see a connection with the text we're looking at in regards to where we're going with the Holy Spirit series, because the passage we're talking about relates very closely to those things. Well, we have been walking through different truths about power of prayer and God's Word over the past several weeks. I would encourage you to go to our website. You can be able to see those or YouTube channel, whichever one works best for you, and to unpack those things. We have looked at the importance of prayer and fasting. Uh, A few weeks ago, we looked at being strong and courageous from Joshua 1 with the Word of God and how that God tells us not to turn left or to the right. We looked a couple of weeks ago from Jeremiah 29, how we're supposed to be living as exiles in this world. God told the exiles that were in Babylon that they were to pray for their city and they were supposed to seek him with all of their heart. The very truth that Mallory even mentioned in her testimony. And last week we looked at Mark chapter 9, verses 23, and the story of the man who had a son who had uh, epilepsy and had this demonic possession in regards to what was happening with him. He had all these symptoms of epilepsy. But then he came to Christ and Jesus says all things are possible for those who believe. Today we come to John chapter 17. And yes, we're back in the gospel of John. Many of you say we're in the John again. We went through the book of John uh, for a couple of years walking through that series. But when we looked at John chapter 17, this particular text that we're looking at, I preached from verses 6 all the way through 21, more in a macro view as opposed to really micro honing in on this particular truth that we're talking about today. And that is in verse 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the sanctifying power of the word of God. In chapter 17, Jesus is giving what is called the high priestly prayer. It is the prayer that he prays for his disciples. It's the prayer that he prayed for those who would believe in the word the disciples would proclaim. It was the night that Jesus was going to be arrested, crucified the next day. It is his last prayer for us. And it was in that passage of Scripture that Jesus is setting the stage to commission the disciples to go into the world, to serve the world, share the gospel of the world. And this is what he is praying, this reality that they need to be sanctified by the truth, by the word of God for this mission. And for you and for me, I want you to hear the importance of this passage of Scripture that Jesus gave the disciples and he gave to us. We're going to see in this text, Jesus made it very clear that he is sending them into the world and the means for them to be able to stay focused on the mission was through the spirit-empowered truth that they already heard. For you and me, this is the connection even with the Holy Spirit series. This word that we are holding, this word that I'm proclaiming to you is not just words on a page. These are spirit-empowered words. By the Holy Spirit. And Jesus prayed in order for the disciples to stay focused on the mission, to stay on mission, they needed to be sanctified by the truth that they heard. The same is true for you and me. If you and I as followers of Jesus Christ want to stay focused for Christ, we want to stay focused on the mission that Christ has given us. You can't do it simply on human resolve. You need the power of the Spirit of God, and you need the power through the Word of God who is inspired or which is inspired by the Spirit of God. This is why this sermon is called the sanctifying power of the Word of God. 
We're going to unpack this text with three questions today. What does it mean to be sanctified? Two, why is the Word of God powerful? And three, how does this sanctification through the Word work? Three questions. What is it? Why is it powerful? And three, how does this practically play out? Let's read the text this morning, and then I'll give you an illustration to help us to understand our thinking in regards to being sanctified by the Word of God and understanding what this means for us today. John 17, we're going to pick up in verse 14. Jesus, again, this is His prayer directed to God. Jesus is praying for His present disciples that were with Him, and that ends in verse 19, and then we'll just read verse 20 and 21, where Jesus began to pray for those who were going to believe through the words that the disciples were going to proclaim. And that means that's referring to us. All those who were succeeding after, after the disciples and their proclamation, that's where the prayer begins. But the same truth that Jesus gave the disciples is, is the same truth It applies to us. Let's read the text. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, And I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. We have read verse 20 and 21 for this reason. I want you to see the truths that we're going to unpack in verses 14 through 19 are the same truths that apply to you and me. Because in verse 20, Jesus says, I'm not just praying for them, I'm praying for those who will believe in their word. So the truth that we're talking about, the sanctifying power of the Word of God, is not just for the apostles. It is for us today in 2024. Let me give you an illustration to help you to understand what this text is referring to in the sanctification process. Many of you may immediately have some terminology or some definitions in your mind about sanctification. Well, let me help you to understand it here. Some of you, when you were hired at a job or you were set apart for a job, there was requirements for you that in order to keep that job, there were things that you had to do to maintain that job, to keep your position. We call that in some circles continuous education or in some places it's professional development, that you are able to maintain what the mission is that you have been hired for, and you have to be reminded of that vision and that mission continually so that you are not just coasting. It's no different than an athlete, for example, who gets chosen for a college athletic team. They're given a scholarship, and they can't just coast. They've been chosen. They've been set aside for that team, and then there are expectations that they have to do to maintain that they are on the team, working for the team, there may be exercises and discipline. For those that's been in the military, you understand there's boot camp that people have to go through to be chosen for that particular branch of the military. And then there's PT tests that you have to do to make certain that you're staying up with your physicality so that you can not just be chosen for it, but that you can stay in it, active and ready. As a believer... The comparable is this, when God saves you, you are set apart for the kingdom. And the way by which we're going to stay on task, on mission, and ready is our continuous education, our professional development, our spiritual exercise, and that is done through the word of God. This is what Jesus is referring to. 
He is not referring to sanctification in the initial stage when someone got saved because he's talking to the believers in this moment. The apostles were already set apart. The sanctification that he is referring to in this passage of Scripture is the ongoing work of the Spirit. So that is our first question. What is the sanctification that Jesus is talking about in this passage of Scripture? Now, the answer to that question is simply this. In this passage of Scripture, in this context, it means to be sanctified by the truth. means we are continually being set apart by the Word of God for the mission of God. Let's put the answer on the screen, please. So the answer to what it means to be sanctified is to be sanctified by the truth means we are continually being set apart by the Word of God for the mission of God. So if Christ is praying that they're sanctified by the truth, this is what the Word does. But there's two realities I want to point out to you in this passage of Scripture. Number one, those who are followers of Jesus are hated by the world. This is not going to be on the screen. Everybody's looking at the screen. This is looking at me and in your Bible right now. Okay, the first one, I show it to you there in verse 14. Look at it again. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You and I need to understand that if we are living on mission for Jesus, your beliefs, your methods, your practices, your convictions, and your ideologies will clash with worldly convictions, worldly practices, worldly ideologies, and worldly practices. And so... Sometimes those clashes will cause people to not just dislike you, but to hate you. You should be paying attention and seeing that within the news and media that there is an escalation of those very things around the world. And so Jesus is saying in this context, he's sending them on mission. And he's letting them know as he's praying, the world is going to hate them. You saw the mission. Look at verse 18 very quickly again. I have sent them as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Where do we live? We live in the world. Connect this to the truth we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We're exiles in this world. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with the presence of God. So there is a truth that there is a reality that the world may hate us. You say, well, i got friends that's in the world and they don't hate me. That's great. But the general truth is Satan, who is the ruler of this world, is not friends with you. His, his rule, his demons are against us. Jesus has made it very clear. Look back at John 16, verse 33, what the world is going to be like for those who are living on mission for Christ. What does he say in verse 33 of John 16? I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace, but in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Let's not forget this prayer in chapter 17 follows that truth in chapter 16. We will have tribulation as we're in the world. So if we can understand this number one reality, the world hates us, we need to understand this is the significance of why Jesus is praying in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Because the world is going to be opposed to them, the world is going to be opposed to us. What's the second reality? Very quickly in verse 15, not just the world is opposed to us, but Satan, the arch enemy, does not like the followers of Jesus Christ. You see it there in verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from who? The evil one. The evil one is Satan himself. He is our arch enemy. He is our adversary. He is the prince of this world, as the scriptures talk about. And so that's our realities that we are facing and why it gives us the urgency that we need the Word of God. Some of you may say, well, it's just words on a page. It's just history, what's really there. Well, I would remind you, just to write this verse down, John 6 and 63, Jesus says, My words are spirit and life. Hebrews tells us that this word is sharper than a two-edged sword as well. It can pierce even to the marrow of our bone. These words... Our spirit inspired. I want you to understand the reason why Jesus is praying that these disciples and us are sanctified by the word of God because it is powerful in what he does. Now, let's unpack this meaning here in regards to this definition there in verse 17 when Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. I've given you the answer to that definition. That's very clearly that what Jesus is saying, it's the ongoing, continual being set apart for the word of, by the word of God, for the mission of God. Now, let's understand this statement. 
if this sanctification means that it's the continual ongoing setting apart, then that has to mean there was initial setting apart. Are you following me? If Jesus is praying that they're continually sanctified and set apart for the mission of God, how do we know where the mission of God is? I already read that to you. That's in verse 18. He's going to be sending them into the world. So sanctify for that purpose. Then that means that there's an initial sanctification. This is what most of us think about when we think about sanctification. There's this initial setting apart. I want you to understand there's two aspects in those scriptures of sanctification. There is a setting apart to be made holy. And then there's the ongoing process of sanctification where the Spirit of God is working in us for the original mission. If we can understand what the original mission is when Jesus saves us, we will understand what Jesus means right here by sanctify. I'm going to show you two passages, one in the Old Testament and one in the New, that you can understand the basis of what it means. So when you say you're saved, I want you to understand something. Jesus doesn't save you to let you coast. He saves us to set us apart to himself. Now listen closely to what I'm about to tell you. If you're set apart to something, that means you're set apart from something. So if the initial sanctification of God is to set us apart by him, to him, and for him, then that means the sanctification was to set us apart to him and not to the world. For him and not for the world. So when we are saved and sanctified, then God sets us apart for Him. This word sanctification, the root word meaning of this word sanctified is the same word that is used for holy. The hagios in the Greek, it's the same word that's holy spirit, hagios pneuma. It's the same word that's used in the Old Testament when God would consecrate people. It's setting them apart, his anointing power. So when you understand God saves you, he sets you apart. It's the work of the Spirit of God to rescue you from the world, from darkness, from sin, from Satan's kingdom. And only one who does it, it's not us. God is the power who does that. So when we say we're sanctified, we're sanctified by God. We're sanctified to God, meaning that we're for Him, and we're sanctified for His purpose. Those three things. By Him, to Him, for Him. You got it? Let me show you the Old Testament passage. I told you to turn there earlier. Exodus chapter 19. You see this picture. In this moment where Moses is called by God up on the mountain, and the people of Israel have come out of Egyptian slavery, and Moses has led them, and God is going to speak a covenantal word to Moses and to the people. And this covenantal word is in regards to being set apart, to be made holy, and to be consecrated. And I'm going to show you that the initial setting apart in the Old Testament is the same truth that Jesus is talking about. And if we can put our minds around what it means in the original sanctification when we get saved, when we confess our sins to Jesus Christ, when we profess Him as Lord of our lives. It's in that moment that we are sanctified, set apart for Him. What is God doing in that moment? Exodus chapter 19, read with me verses 3 through verses 6, and then we'll look over to a couple other verses there. When Moses went up to God... The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Do you hear the condition that God is giving Moses? If you're going to be my people, I'm going to call you to myself. You will be a holy nation. You will be a treasure possession 
not for them to have a holy huddle. The whole purpose of God choosing them and setting them aside was rooted in the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, when God chose Abraham, he says, From you, I am going to, through you, provide a blessing that's going to be for all the families of all the people of the earth. This choosing of the people of Israel here in Exodus 19 to be a holy priesthood, to be a treasure possession, was this moment where God was sanctifying them and setting them apart for His purpose, His Mission is the words sanctified or consecration used here. Yes, look over verse 10 and verse 14. After Moses heard the words, you can look at the end of the last part of verses 9. Let's just read verse 9 so we can see it all. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you, and you may also believe you forever. While Moses told the words of the people to the Lord... The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Skip down to verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman, which is part of their condition that he was given. You see very clearly here. God was making a condition to set them apart. It's rooted in this consecration. So when we fast forward to John 17, and we see where Jesus is saying, sanctify them in the truth. What's the purpose of sanctification? It's being set apart to be different, to be a holy nation, to be His treasured possession. So being sanctified means it's done by God, to God, for God. He's the one that's doing it. Moses didn't initiate Exodus 19. God did. And he says, I'm going to choose these people. You're going to represent me for this purpose to let God's name and glory be known to all the nations. So you set apart to him for him. Let me show you a New Testament example. I could really chew on that one all morning, but let's go. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the other passage, I want you to see the New Testament passage of Scripture that's a balance to this, that you can now see this very clearly, that God is the one that does the working. He's the one that sets us apart to himself, for himself. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's bad news. But there's good news in verse 10, or verse 11. And such were some of you, you were washed. You were, say it, sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by who? By the Spirit of our God. Yes. So even what God was working there in the Old Testament, Exodus 19, the being brought to himself is done in the name of Christ, but it's done by the Spirit of God. When he says you're washed, that's that cleansing power as we talked about with Mallory's testimony. It's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, that when anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. They are washed. But then we're sanctified, which means we no longer belong to the kingdom of darkness. We now have been set apart for something far greater than what we were. We're sanctified to Christ. We're justified, which is a legal declaration, means that we've been declared right before God. And it's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I want you to see clearly in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, these truths are the same. So when Jesus prays in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. If we understand what the initial sanctification means, which is what I'm explaining to you that's being set apart for God, to be holy for God, for the mission of God, then when we understand Jesus is praying that they would continue to be sanctified, what Jesus was praying for them, what he's praying for us, is that we still will be sanctified, set apart for God, for the mission of God, through the word of God. So we don't just get saved and say, I'm just going to live the way I want to. Now, our flesh wants to do that. The enemy lures us to do that. 
But listen clearly. Jesus is saying the means by which we will be sanctified is not just simply saying, I'm going to be a better person. Being sanctified for the mission of God so that we stay running all the way. Not just sprint just for six months or one year. That we're running the marathon of life so we can cross the finish line and God can say, well done. The means to do that is going to be through the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. I tell you, this is why no matter what counseling situation I am in as a pastor, the first question I always ask is, how is your time with God in the Word? I tell you, when that gets shortfalled, the enemy can quickly sneak in. Let me give you another passage of Scripture that's in the New Testament. I'll put it on the screen for you because I think this passage of Scripture gives a beautiful picture. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it articulates the same terminology that was in Exodus chapter 19. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Do you see the sanctification work that's in that passage of Scripture? You don't see the word sanctified that's in there, but you see very clearly that when Jesus saved them, us, He says who we are. We are royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. He's set us aside for the mission of God. What's the mission of God? You see it very... That we may do what? Proclaim the excellencies for Christ. That's what you're called to do. Believer, listen to me. God did not save you just to make you miss hell and make heaven. He saved you to be on mission, to live with purpose, to live with something higher than what this world gives us. You are sanctified if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. So what does it mean when Jesus is saying, I am praying that you will sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. He's praying for them that they would hold true to the word of God so that they could stay faithful On the mission of God. Sanctify them. And how many of us would be honest and say we get lured by the worldly pleasures. We get lured by the fleshly appeals. And our zeal for the mission sometimes wanes. I think if many of us would be honest in this moment, moment, we would say yes. We need the sanctifying power of the Word of God. But I want to stop here in the moment for an application point before we talk about the continual aspects. I want to ask you the question. Have you in this room, individually, every one of you, had that moment where you have surrendered to Christ and He has set you apart and made you a holy nation? Have you had that moment or that period of time That you can look and say, yes, I can't remember a when, but God saved me. Then here's what I want you to understand. He set you apart for Himself. You're not second class. He made you His. He says you're treasured possession. You were a holy priesthood, which means you are the elect chosen ones. When he says the priests are the only ones who could go in the holy of holies in the presence of God. And so if we're his holy priesthood, that means we all get to go into his presence. For those who believed in him understand this is what it means. This is not something to be prideful or boastful about. It's something to be humble and say, oh God, thank you because the enemy is good at lying to us and telling us that we are nothing. But I'm here to remind you, God chose you and through salvation He saved you and made you a part of Him. And if that's the case, understand there is an ongoing work that's taking place. So I remind you, go back to John 17. You were in 1 Corinthians 6. Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So the sanctification is that ongoing work by the Spirit of God, to keep us on mission with God so that we can be able to do the work of God. Now, let's ask the second question. Why then, if this sanctification is this ongoing setting apart for God and this is the Word of God, does it? why then is the Word powerful to accomplish this? Why is it that the Word is what keeps us 
set apart for the mission of God. You understand Jesus doesn't say, hey, go to a cheerleading session once a week. He doesn't say just go to a conference so you can get better. All those things, worship services, conferences, elevate us. But you need something on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning. You need something when you're on the mountain. And you need something when you're in the valley, when you get a diagnosis, when things aren't going well, when your marriage is falling apart, your finances are falling apart. You need something that's going to sustain you and not let you get distracted. You need focus. And the only thing that's going to do that is not just your zeal. You need something outside of you. You and I need the power of the Word of God. And the reason why it's so powerful, listen, here is the answer. It's because the Word of God is Holy Spirit inspired. And the Holy Spirit who inspired the Word is the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And the Holy Spirit who lives in us will use the Word of God to speak to us To convict us. I told someone not too long ago, actually last week, I had the privilege of leading someone to Christ, and I told them, I said, this is what's going to happen to you. The Bible studies you sit in now and the sermons that you sit in now is going to make a whole lot more sense. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the things of God are spiritually discerned, which means when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, He begins to give you the understanding that you didn't have before. All that we can understand before is just with our intellect and maybe by God's good grace, but when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us, this Word comes alive. And so the reason why this Word, when Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth, your Word is truth, the reason why I'm saying it has the power is because Jesus makes it very clear that His words, these words that were uttered through God to the prophets, And all of the apostles who wrote was not through just amazing personalities, but was through the Holy Spirit that breathed out and guided them to write the Word of God. And it is what will change you and me. It's why this will change you. The Advocate and the Times-Picayune and the Newsweek and whatever news article that we're reading will not affect us like this will. Where does it tell us that the Word is connected to the Spirit? Look back with me in John chapter 16, and I want to make the connection between the Holy Spirit and the Word. We see very clearly in John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, there's a couple of them, but I'm just going to give you just a few that's here. In John 16, verses 12 through 13, actually back up with me just one more. Go to chapter 14, and then we can see the connection. Go to John 14, Jesus makes it very clear in verses 15 and 16, that when he leaves, he's going to send another helper to the disciples and to us. John 14, 15, so track me, track with me. I'm going to show you these developments that Jesus is giving here. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of what? Truth. Now, when we talk through this passage of Scripture, I made it a point to you that the word that's used here, another, is not another of a different kind, but another of the same kind, meaning if Jesus says another helper's coming, that implied that he was the helper for them while he was here, and he's saying, when I leave, there's going to be another one coming of the exact same nature like me, meaning the Holy Spirit is not just some kind of force. You're already getting part of next week's sermon. He is God himself. And then, chapter 14, verses 25, These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now go to chapter 16 of the text that we were going to look at just a moment ago. Chapter 16, verses 13. And when the Spirit of what? Truth comes. Now you understand the spirit of truth is referring to the Holy Spirit. Now read John 17, 17 with that in mind. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. What's the Holy Spirit? He's the spirit of truth. So the word is given through the spirit of God. And so the word of God, when we're talking about the power, comes from not just words, but from the Holy Spirit of Of truth, which means if he's the spirit of truth, he's not going to be the spirit of falsehood, the spirit of error, or the spirit of confusion, or the spirit of chaos. He's the spirit 
of truth. And so if we want to be sanctified continually for the mission that God has given us, and we don't want error, we don't want confusion, we don't want falsehood, we don't want to be led astray, guess what we need? We need the spirit of truth. And the Word's going to do that for us. Because I tell you, if you don't listen to this truth, the world is going to give you something very close to the truth, but it's not going to be true. And so we need the Spirit of truth to keep us on the straight and narrow to make certain that we are understanding this. Now, let me help you to understand something very clearly. You may have a great resolve to be in the Word every day, and I pray that you are. But I want you to understand that there's something outside of you and me that is doing this sanctification work. When I say outside of me, I mean outside of my power, but I'm also referring to the Spirit of God who lives in us as believers. Jesus teaches us in verses 19 that this sanctification is done not by you and me. It is done by the Spirit of God who is higher than us, who has the power to do this work. Look at verse 19. For their sake, I consecrate myself. There's that same word. Remember in Moses' day, Exodus 19, they were consecrated the people of God to make them set apart. Now Jesus says, I consecrate myself. This can't mean that he's making himself more holy because Jesus is what? Holy. So he's consecrating himself for what purpose? He's consecrating himself for his mission, his purpose. Write this verse down. We don't have time to turn there. John 10, 36. It is where Jesus is talking about how the Father consecrated him to come into the world. And now Jesus is saying, I've consecrated myself. I've consecrated myself. Meaning I have set myself apart for the mission. What was his mission? To seek and save the lost. To be the atoning sacrifice. To go to the cross to be the payment for our sins. Christ is saying, I've set myself apart for this. Why? What does the text say? And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. What in the world is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that he consecrated himself for the mission that was ahead of him so that we could be sanctified in truth. This word, I'm going to get technical with you. I rarely do this. I'm going to give you the Greek explanation of this. This is in the perfect tense of the Greek. And it's in the passive form, which means it's something that's done and it has continual effects. And it's in the passive form, which means it's someone else doing the work for us. Jesus says, I've consecrated myself to the cross So that they could be sanctified. What does Jesus mean by this? Look at John 16 verse 7. I want you to see what Jesus says about him leaving. And about the Holy Spirit coming. Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away. The helper will not come to you. What is Jesus saying? In John 17, 19, I've consecrated myself to my mission because if I go, the Holy Spirit's come so you can be sanctified in truth. Yes! We sit here today not by our power. Your successes, your accomplishments... You're saying no to sin. You're saying yes to righteousness is because of the sanctifying power, living, breathing God who's in you. And this is done through meeting with God. In my own personal life and my years of being a follower of Jesus, and you can attest to what I'm about to tell you, that when you're inconsistent with your time with God, you see the effects and the ramifications in your own life. When you are consistent with God, I am not equating consistency with perfection. Please do not hear me. But when we are consistent with God, spending time with God, then we are putting ourselves under the power of the Word of God to give us the ability to be sanctified in truth. I want to give this as a visual illustration for you this morning on the screen. 
This is not fancy. That's called dots, church. <laughs> but many people say, well, I'm in the Word of God. Well, the red represents your time in the Word. Those are seven dots across the week. Some of you are in the first line. Your only exposure to the Word of God is you may bring your Bible, may not bring your Bible, you just listen to it being taught a small group, maybe just in worship. Some of you may be like second week. Maybe it's just twice a week. It's on Sunday morning, maybe Wednesday night, or maybe just one other time. Some of you the third week. Maybe you just got to add one more day that's there. Maybe Sunday, maybe Wednesday, maybe it's a Thursday or Friday. That last week is someone who's trying in their best to be consistent, to be in the Word of God. Now, I understand not every one of us is going to be perfect in every particular way. But if Jesus says that in order for us to be sanctified, we need to be in the truth, He said, sanctify them in the truth. Then if I'm going to be sanctified in the truth, that means I need to be in the Word. If I want God to continually set me apart for the mission of God, and not for what Byron Brown wants, then when I'm coming to Christ, and I am just spending time with him under this powerful word of God, then God is going to use the word to continue to sanctify me, to help me be on mission for him. Now, I pray that this small visual illustration will help you to see. This is not to say, and listen, this is not about just checking the box every day either. Just so you can say, well, I read seven days. I'm good. This is about genuinely meeting with God and setting before Him and letting the truth work in us. You've heard me say before, it's not about just getting through the Word. It's about the Word getting through us. I challenge you. I'll take Mallory's testimony. John Jeremiah says, those who genuinely seek Him with all their heart, you will find God. He's not hiding behind a tree. He's not hiding behind his throne. He is with open arms wanting us to find him. Sanctified in the truth. Well, let me give you the third question. As a way by which, how does this work practically? How does the word sanctify us as we sit under it? I'm just going to give you a few examples. There are plenty more than what I can give you. But I want to show you, go back to John 16 and 17. And I want to show you what the Spirit says He will do. And I want to just give you a couple examples of this. And hopefully as an encouragement to you. So how does the Word of God continually sanctify us for God and our mission? Number one, the Holy Spirit uses the Word to convict us of sin. Now, why is that important for the mission of God? Because sin is the very opposite of the mission of God. Sin focuses on me, myself, and I. It's us. It's about what we want to do. But the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin because that means sin keeps us from living on the mission of God. Where is that here in this passage of Scripture? Remember, if if Jesus is praying that we'll be continually sanctified, then the sanctification that happened initially that was done by the Spirit of God is what the Spirit of God is going to continue to do in us. Look at John 16. When Jesus said the Spirit was going to come, this is what Jesus said the Spirit would do. What does He say that He was going to do? Look back up at verses 8 and 9. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Because concerning sin, because they don't believe in Me. So think about it. If the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin to get you into the kingdom, do you think that you're off the hook if there's other sins? He's going to continually convict us of sin so that we can be on mission with God. Do you think that Jesus ever had to confront the disciples with their sin? Do you remember when Jesus talked about going to go to the cross and going to die? And Peter pulled him aside and said, no, 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 you don't need to do that. Do you know what Jesus said to him? I'm so sorry, I think you have that wrong. No, he said to him, get behind me, Satan. That was strong words, right? And so the point was, Jesus was confronting the disciples, and what Jesus says is, now I want you to continue to sanctify them through the truth. The way that Jesus operated with the disciples is the way the Holy Spirit's going to operate with us through the Word. How many of you have been reading the Word? You thought you were completely fine, and you read the Word, and God says, boom, this is in your life. Anybody had that conviction before? 
Or you think that you're fine, you're sitting in a Bible study, you're sitting in a sermon, and all of a sudden God speaks to you, and you're like, oh my goodness, I did not see that. Because what happens is we set ourselves before the mirror of the sanctification, the power of the Word of God, and He convicts us of sin. For you see the enemy, remember, what does Jesus say? Protect us from the evil one. Correct? The evil one would say to us, it's just one time. It's just one sin. That's not going to bother anybody. The Bible tells us, and the Holy Spirit, if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you. In Titus chapter 2, the Bible tells us in Titus 2, 12, it says that we, God has called us to renounce ungodliness and to live an upright, godly life. This is what the Word calls us to. So the second thing, what does He do? He does convict us of sin. The Holy Spirit, through His Word, teaches us how to live righteously. What did He say that He convicts us of? There in John 16, verses 9 and 10. And verses 10, and He convicts us concerning righteousness. We are unrighteous before we get saved. Amen? We're not living correctly. But then when God saves us, He gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so the Spirit of God helps us, not just convict us of sin, but then convicts us through the Word of God, how we are then to live rightly as we continue to live on mission with God. Because again, the enemy doesn't want us to live rightly. Here's let me just give you a personal example. In my personal Bible reading time right now, I'm going through the book of 2 Chronicles. And this past week, I read through chapter 17 through 21, which covered King Jehoshaphat's rule of Judah. We've used King Jehoshaphat in chapter 20 as an example of fasting and prayer, where he sits before God, he brings all the nation to God, and they proclaim a fast, and they say before God, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. But preceding that, though, in chapter 17 and 18, he follows an ungodly king. And so what he does, he set out and he does all these reforms for the nation of Judah. He tears down false worship. And it says, and then the fear of God came upon all the people because he was leading them to live righteously. But then in chapter 18, after he's seen the blessings and the favor of God, King Ahab, the king of Israel, comes to him and says, Hey, Jehoshaphat, why don't you align with us and let's go attack these other nations that surround us? Jehoshaphat says, was there any prophets here that can tell us? 400 prophets show up and say, go into battle because you're going to win. And Jehoshaphat says, is there not anybody else here that can tell us something? And then King Ahab says, man, there's this one guy named Micaiah, but he always prophesies against me. I don't like him. Micaiah shows up. And guess what Micaiah says? Don't go. And then King Ahab says, see, I told you. He always says what I want to hear. But Jehoshaphat, even though he had asked for truth, he listened to the false messages. He had seen the favor of God. And so he chooses to listen to the wrong voices. And so the prophet, Micaiah, gets arrested. And he says, if what I have said does not come true, then I'm a false prophet. So Ahab and Jehoshaphat goes into battle. Now this should already be a warning. Jehoshaphat is told by King Ahab. King Ahab says, hey, I'm not going to put my kingly garments on, but you put yours on. We'll go into battle. Now you tell me. Does that sound fishy? That's like saying, hey, uh, I'm going to take care of myself. And then the scripture says, and then someone pulled a bow at random, and guess who it hit? Ahab. But the war, they actually came after Jehoshaphat first because he was wearing the kingly garments. And the Bible says he screamed out. And as he screamed out to God, God heard him and he was protected. The next chapter, you know what it is? King Jehoshaphat repents and returns back to the Lord because he recognized he had not trusted in God. And then the Bible says, and then the fear of the Lord came again. Now you say, how does that relate to the sanctifying power of the Word of God? Because when you're reading the words of God, you're reminded that we are so prone to be just like Jehoshaphat. We're so prone to be dependent upon God, have reforms of God, and then very quickly forget to listen to the voice of God. And listen to ourselves. And that passage reminds me, as I'm reading through that, my prayer is, oh God, help me not to be self-reliant. But I would be dependent upon you so that I can do the mission of God. So his word will teach us how to live righteously. Now let me give you one last one, which is the umbrella for them all. The Holy Spirit's word 
will guide us into all truth. So we will glorify his name. If the word is to sanctify us, this is where it's almost like the catchphrase for all of it. In John 16, look back with me. Jesus tells us what the Holy Spirit's going to do. I love this passage of scripture. I could teach on this one a lot. Verses 12, I still have many things to say to you, but when you cannot bear it, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into what part of the truth, church? All the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will say this, glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's put these two things together. The Holy Spirit comes. He's going to declare to you all things. Jesus has already said, sanctify us through the word of truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, he's going to guide us into what God has already proclaimed, what Jesus has proclaimed. He's going to guide us into all truth. But then notice with me, this is the catch for them all. It's the umbrella of which all of them fit. He says, and his job is to glorify me. So the Holy Spirit's role through the Word of God is to help you and me to bring glory to God. That is His purpose. So when you get convicted of sin, it's because sin doesn't glorify Him. When you're reading the Word of God and the Holy Spirit says you need to do these things, it's because those things will glorify God. When the Holy Spirit says something to you through the Word of God, put those things down, it's because those things don't glorify his name this is the purpose of being under the sanctifying spirit of the word of god because god wants you and me our lives as believers to be on mission our mission is to seek and save the lost but to bring glory to his name so mine and your job as believers we rest in what god can do but we discipline ourselves to do what we can do and that is we make time to sit under the sanctifying power of the Word. Now, I don't know where you are today, whether you've had initial sanctification, where God has saved you, made you part of the kingdom, or not. My first invitation from this text today is this. The same God who could set the people of Israel aside to make them a holy nation, a royal priesthood. The same God who could say the words in 1 Corinthians 6... And he listed all those sins and he says, none of those people are getting into the kingdom. He says, but you can be washed. You can be sanctified. You can be justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. If you have not had that moment, whether you're in this room or whether you're watching online, I'm inviting you today to the sanctifying, saving, cleansing power of Jesus. I'm inviting you to surrender your lives. I'm inviting you with the same plea that Jesus gave. Repent of your sin, believe that He's the Savior, and follow Him. And in that moment when you do that, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised Him from the dead. When you truly believe that, God will give the Holy Spirit to come live inside of you. And because He's living inside of you, that's what makes you set apart That's what makes you belong to Him. And if you've not done that, I'm inviting you to do that today. There's nothing. You've heard me say before, certainly it's personal, but God never calls us to a private relationship. He's called us to surrender to Him. And some of you in this room, and some of you in line, need to make that decision today. And in a moment when we respond, there's going to be people that will be here to receive you, to pray. And if you need that, you can come today. You can bow your head where you are, or driving down the road, or kneel at your couch, whatever it is. But I'm inviting you to the powerful, sanctifying, cleansing power of Christ. For some of you in this room, you've had that sanctification, but you've allowed yourself to slip into worldly pleasures. You've allowed yourself to slip into a decline of consistency, of being under the Word of God. And today, God, through His Spirit of God, of proclaiming the truth... It's convicting you. It's revealing things to you. And whatever He's sanctifying right now in your life, you need to let it go. You need to lay it down. 
This is a stage, and you can make an altar out of it, but the altar is in our heart to lay before him and say, God, I need to give you this. You've held on to it long enough. If you want God to sanctify you and get you to the next level, you need to let go of whatever it is you're hanging on to. And some of you may not necessarily have a particular sin or an issue, but you saw the dots on the screen, and God used that to say to you, you've been apathetic, you've been lackadaisical, You've not been disciplined. Listen, it's not just sitting before God to check up a box. You need to meet with Him because God wants to meet with you. And He wants to do something in us. He wants to change us. He wants to fill us with the Spirit of God so that you can live on mission for God. Some of you have just been living for your own thing and maybe that's where you need to start today. Say, God, I have lived for myself. I have lived for my wishes, my plans, and my purposes. God, would you give your mission be my mission? Maybe that's where some of you need to be today. And some of you, as you've listened through some of this, you realize, you know, maybe you're not knowing how to study the Word, and maybe you're saying, I'm trying to do this all on my own. Listen, I want to invite you. You have the privilege to come in this room for me to teach you the Word of God, and I cherish this moment. I hold this moment in high regard to study the Word, to teach you the Word of God, and I'm grateful for this moment. But some of you may need a small group to be in a smaller setting You can be able to be involved so you can have people pour into you. Maybe you need someone one-on-one discipleship. Whatever it is that you need, we want to provide for you so you can be sanctified by the power of God's Word. Listen, regardless of where you are, I don't care if you were seven dots, one dot, two dot, three dots. God wants all of His people to be continually sanctified by the truth. You say, how do I know that? Because in the earlier part of John 17, verse 6 and verse 12, Jesus said, I've kept them in your word, God. Now I'm praying that you will keep them through the Spirit. Don't think for one moment, because you've been faithful last week, that you're guaranteed faithfulness this week. We need His help. Don't think that you've got it on your own. But the beauty is, remember John 17, 19? Jesus consecrated himself so we could be sanctified by the truth. There's help. There's help. Call out to him and let him help you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder of the sanctifying power of your word, which is done through the spirit of God in this word and the spirit of God which lives in us. Lord, you've spoken to our hearts this morning. You've encouraged us and reminded us that your word is powerful. Thank you, Lord, that when you set us apart, you don't leave us alone. That you want to continue to sanctify us in your truth so that we can be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for your possession, that we can proclaim your excellencies to the world. Lord, I know that maybe in this, in this moment we've said under your word, you may have convicted people of the need just to be with you more. And God, help them to make the changes that are necessary. But God, you may have convicted some this morning where you have been convicting them and they, you've been prodding them and they've not been willing to surrender and listen. And God, I pray today, grant them power by your Spirit to lay their sins down. Grant them power by your Spirit to pick up whatever it is that you're telling them to do so that we can be sanctified in your truth. But God, there may be some here who've never experienced that initial moment of your sanctifying power through salvation. So God, I pray if that's any in this room, any who are watching today or any who watched this sermon years gone by, I pray, God, that in this moment, Lord, would you reach them and would they surrender their lives to you so they could be set apart, rescued from the world, and set apart for you. Thank you, Lord, that you promise to do that. And now, God, in this moment of response, simply help us to be obedient to what you have shown us to do today. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand, we'll respond in song. As I mentioned, you can bring your prayer cards here. Kneel over them. Pray over them. Church family, if you want to just come pray over some of these cards, you're welcome to come. If you need to respond in any of the ways I've mentioned, there will be those here to receive you for prayer this morning. You respond as God has spoken to you today.